Residential schools, the words ring with horror, racism, and guilt. Canada has apologized for what happened, but decided that wasn't enough. Five years ago, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established to go further. This week, the TRC holds its final hearings in Alberta. Wab Canoe is a freelance broadcaster and documentary filmmaker. He's in Winnipeg tonight. Here in Toronto, Gabrielle Scrimshaw is the co-founder of the Aboriginal Professional Association of Canada. And Hayden King is with Ryerson University and the Centre for Indigenous Governance. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, the background from Duncan McHugh. Remember that apology to the survivors of Indian residential schools? And we apologize for failing to protect you. Momentous as it was, it was a small part of a settlement to make reparations to over 150,000 children taken from their families. Perhaps as significant, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission dubbed the TRC. I'm happy. That is the way. The world's first ever court-ordered Truth Commission, given five years to record the history of the schools, price tag over $60 million. Things got off to a rocky start when the first commissioners couldn't work together and resigned. New commissioners headed by Justice Murray Sinclair were chosen, and the TRC began crisscrossing the country, holding hearings attended by tens of thousands of Canadians. That what happened at the residential schools was the use of education for cultural genocide. Several thousand survivors have given testimonies, often gut-wrenching. It's really hard going through abuse and feeling so dirty and so ashamed. The TRC also dug into archives. Records now confirm over 4,000 children died in the schools. Ottawa's refusal to turn over historical documents has become an ongoing legal battle. It's not a positive information, so it doesn't surprise me that it's not um, there on the list of things that they want to make announcements about. To share that truth with all Canadians. But the biggest challenge, the TRC's mandate to lead Aboriginal peoples and Canadians on a path to reconciliation. Efforts towards healing include a national marker, the preservation of historical sites, plans for a national research centre, the inevitable question, though, what, if anything, has changed? For the survivors in this room, the most important gesture of reconciliation that they will ever see in their lives is for you to tell them that you love them. This week's gathering is the last national event and sets the stage for the TRC's final report next year. Duncan McHugh, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, I think most people would agree, agree that the truth has been told over these last five years. But as Duncan says, the tough part now is reconciliation. I want to talk about that, but I, I, I got to start by asking you to define, and Wob, why don't you help us with this one? De what does reconciliation mean on this issue? Well, I think that, first of all, there is a reconciliation that needs to happen around residential schools and the first thing that we need to do is recognize the truth of the residential school survivors and understand that for them the healing journey is not going to stop with the end of the TRC and we should be prepared and willing to honor their stories uh, to be told over and over again as long as they are with us. Beyond that I think that we need to commit as a nation to preserving their stories, preserving the memory of the experiences that they had and helping to have that instruct us as we go forward so that we can make sure that something like this never happens in this country again. Gabrielle, what does reconciliation mean to you? When I think of reconciliation, I really think about the relationship that it represents. And in fact, you know, the truth part of this is really only the first stepping stone in a much long, longer journey. Um, and it will take a multifaceted approach, I believe, for all Canadians. Um, reconciliation does not just involve Indigenous people of this country speaking their truths. It involves a much larger process of honouring those truths through our educational system moving forward and resetting the relationship and, and understanding our shared history as Canadians. Hayden, what about you? Um, well, I, I think I would probably disagree with the, the statement that most people would believe that the truth has been told. I really okay. don't think that 
I really think that uh, you know, if you if you ask the majority of Canadians, I think the statistics would would remain the same from 2008, in which you know, little over half of Canadians actually had heard of residential schools, or that 15% of Canadians knew that abuse went on in residential schools, or that 10% of Canadians even knew that you know schools were meant to destroy Indigenous cultures. Uh, yeah, so, but I guess what I'm getting at is what I'm saying, the truth has been told on those issues, but mm -hmm, the question mm -hmm. is whether anyone's listening that yeah. leads to reconciliation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people watching this, it may be the first time they're, they're even hearing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or that we're in this era of reconciliation. So I think you're right uh, on that latter point that, that people are telling truths, but are, are Canadians listening? I, I'm not so sure. You know, it's interesting because we asked uh, a number of young Indigenous Canadians and different parts of the country that question about reconciliation and whether they thought the TRC would lead to that, whether we were now embarking on a period of, of reconciliation. Here are their thoughts on that question. I do feel like reconciliation is something that we can achieve. It's going to take a lot of time, commitment from both parties, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I often thought and still think that maybe if those terms were ones that were necessary to use, maybe the proper use of them would have been truth towards reconciliation. Do I believe that reconciliation is achievable? I do. Do I believe reconciliation is achievable under the current mandate of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission? No. All right. Now, it's interesting because there's a difference of opinion there, but I'm trying to understand what that last point was, what that last fellow was trying to tell us. Uh, in his concerns about what he thinks can happen. What, what's he telling us? Well, I can't read uh, Michael Champagne's mind, but what I think that he's getting at is that there's a very delineated uh, mandate that the TRC has, and in fact, that will come to an end in 2015, and it's unlikely that we're going to achieve a full reconciliation uh, between Indigenous people and the rest of the country in the next year or so. Rather, what it is going to be is an ongoing process uh, that takes place over the rest of our lives. So what I think that we should really be starting the conversation about is how are we going to take the truths that the TRC tells us and use that to inform us on the way forward. And the way that I would suggest that Canadians might do that is based on a question that I've been asking myself these past five years as I've been hearing the stories of residential schools. I've been asking myself, if I were alive during that era, what would I have done? Could I have stood up for justice? Could I have stood up for these children? And by forming that bond of empathy, I think that we can start to change things today which are the echoes and the legacies of the residential school experience. So we ought to ask ourselves, what can we do today to address missing and murdered Indigenous women? What can we do today to address the number of Indigenous children who are in the child welfare system or the funding that gap that exists with respect to First Nations children? So I think that we really need to look at the TRC, hear the truths that are telling it, that it is telling us rather, and then find ways that we can apply that to the contemporary context in which we now live. Gabrielle, what would, you, what would you tell those young people? You know, I really believe, and, and Wab hit this point, you know, right on its head, that we write our, our history as a country every single day through the choices we make, through the things we say, through the things that we don't say. Um, and that's around our dinner tables and in our classrooms. And I think that the skepticism that you heard you know, is justified um, that there has been, it's no secret that there has been tensions between Indigenous people and this country's government and that there's a lack of trust that stems from that. That being said, I also heard optimism when you sort of speak to Indigenous youth and Indigenous people across this country that, you know what, seven generations of Indigenous people have gone through these um, residential schools. But indig as Indigenous people, we've been around for thousands of years uh, through our culture, our history. History. And I think that we'll be around for thousands of years to come. So I feel like there's an optimism there as well in the community for us to start looking forward as a community. Aiden, I want you to handle this next one. It's one of the, we asked these uh, young people to, to give us their questions for you on this panel. Uh, and this one is really intriguing. Watch this and, and think about an answer to this. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is, um, from non-Indigenous people asking me what can, what can we as Canadians do to help things change? And I don't ever really have an answer that I feel is articulate enough. So I'd like to know from you 
what can Canadians do to help things change um, a little bit more meaningful in a faster way? You know, that, that seems to have been the challenge for years, for decades. Still exists, so she's not alone in, in, in trying to find the right way to ask that question and to articulate the concern. How do you respond to it, Hayden? I think there, there are probably two parts to my answer. I think the first part is that, that uh, Canadians should be educating themselves in a meaningful way and beyond educating themselves, educating their friends and their family. And it's not a simple task. You know, I still have, you know, I still have friends and families that, are, that refuse to open a book and learn about it, Indigenous Canadian relationships. And it's a real problem. So it's a struggle uh, for Indigenous peoples to actually, you know, convince those to, to, to begin this learning journey and uh, uh, appreciate some truth. And so first, educate yourself, educate your friends, educate your family. Uh, but also, you know, start turning the mirror on yourself. You know, start looking at the institutions in Canadian society that continue to marginalize Indigenous peoples. The best th place that Canadians can help is to start looking at our justice system and trying to answer the questions about why we have 90% in some jails, 90% uh, of the po prison population native, or uh, nearly 1,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women, or, or you know, hundreds of thousands of children in, in child welfare. Agencies. I mean, ec economic development, education, health care. Native people are at the bottom of every socioeconomic indicator in this country, and Canadians need to be asking critical questions about their own society. Uh, and so that's, I think, the, the second part of my answer and where, where uh, Canadians would serve the, uh, the, the most good or help Indigenous peoples the most. Why do you think Canadians aren't asking themselves those questions, Gabrielle? I think it's a really difficult truth um, or a difficult mirror to hold up to yourself and sort of look at yourself and say, this is the country I grew up in. This is the country I immigrated to. And I think that the distance that many Canadians, you know, hold these issues at, the sort of arm's length that they hold it at, is really defined by the weight of the guilt that they feel when they start to read about the issues of residential schools, the legacies that this has left our communities, the fact that I don't have a mother because of the residential school legacy. If I talk to Canadians about that, naturally, I think it would make anyone feel uncomfortable. But I think true reconciliation is a process that'll come when every Canadian can start to talk about this openly. I think that the fact that any Canadian might even ask, what can I do, is really the first step in a much larger journey. You know, I got to take a break in a moment, but uh, Rob, your answer on the on this question, what would it be? Well, just building off what Gabrielle and Hayden have said, I think that if I could strike a strike a note of optimism, when I travel around Canada, I do hear tons of Canadians saying that they want to do right by Indigenous people, and I think partially it's a generational shift that's happening. A lot of young Canadians recognize the lengths that we need to go to improve uh, the situation with respect to Canada's First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And if I can make one suggestion to those people who are thinking that way, it is to listen before you talk. The TRC has come about as a result of a failed experiment in paternalism and in trying to impose solutions on uh, Indigenous communities from the outside. Today, Indigenous people are smart, we are increasingly educated and we are empowered and we are thinking long and hard about the solutions. What we need from other Canadians is partners who are willing to listen to us and work with us in order to bring those uh, better days about. All right, we've got to take that quick break I was talking about. Well, when we come back, this question. The Conservative government did what no previous government had done. It apologized for the horror of the residential schools. But was that enough? Does the government now need to do more? And welcome back to our special coverage of the final week of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's hearings. At uh, our broadcast tonight, broadcaster Wab Canoe, consultant Gabrielle Scrimshaw, and Ryerson assistant professor <clears throat> Hayden King. Now, in our last segment, we were challenged by uh, young Michael Champagne. He does it again with this question. Um, I think the, the biggest question that I have for the panelists is... Do you feel that the government has been acting in good faith with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission up to this point? All right, there it is, very blunt. Hayden, have they been? Um, I have to say, uh, when the government apolog apologized for residential schools, I thought it was an important moment, and I thought many other people did. 
Uh, I think the TRC has done its best. Um, you know, the federal government has withheld documents from, from the TRC throughout the process, which has been a very adversarial position. Um, and, and these were documents dealing with the truth aspect? That's right. I mean, right. The, the TRC's mandate is to write the story of residential schools, and it can't do that without the hundreds of thousands of documents that the federal government is withholding that has to take the government to court to, to, to get these documents. Uh, and I think, you know, I think the, the, the circumstances or the events that have happened between 2000 and, and today, even if independent of the TRC, are indicative of a government that's, a, you know, I might use the word hostile to indigenous peoples from from trying to extinguish title and land claims to taking little action on, on, on missing and murdered indigenous women to using the language of reconciliation to try to collaborate on disempowering uh, education legislation. I think that it's, uh, um, you know, I think, that, I think that Michael has a lot to be, to, to be cynical about and to, and to question about the process. All right, Gabrielle. I think what most Canadians need to understand is that there has been tensions between Indigenous people and this country's government for quite some time. Obviously warranted when we think about the residential schools, um, but even just the settlement of this country. So, you know, his very direct question is a great question, and I think that it's warranted. Um, you know, to further Hayden's point, the government has shown hesitation in the past and actively withheld documents outlining the abuses um, that happened in these residential schools, most recently St. Anne's Residential School, just in January, where the court had to, uh, where they had to endure, endure a year and a half legal battle just to get thousands of documents which outlined the use of electric chair abuse on children. So, you know, does that sound like a government acting in good faith to a commission um, that's supposed to be healing and walking towards this place of reconciliation for all Canadians? All right, you get the last word, Juan. Well. In terms of whether or not the government is acting in good faith, I'm not sure. But I can say this, it's not too late for them to prove that they are. And I would suggest that the Prime Minister should consider his legacy. It's clear that as far as policy regarding First Nations go, he's going to get a rough ride. But 50 years from now, the single thing that people are going to be talking about with respect to his treatment of Indigenous people is the apology. Right now, there is going to be an asterisk next to that apology. People are going to say he apologized, but he didn't completely cooperate with the TRC. There is still time to change that. Hand over all documents now. Talk to the lawyers in the Departments of Justice in AANDC. Make sure that they understand that it, it is a priority, that the government wants to cooperate with this process. And the last thing I'd like to say is we ought to remember that the federal government did not apologize out of their goodwill. They apologized because of the courage of the residential school survivors who launched class action lawsuits. And it was that prospect of billions of dollars of legal liability that forced the government to apologize. And so I really hope that people remember that in as much as the apology came about, it was because of the courage of the residential school survivors. And one of the key lessons of that for me is that we often look at Native people as being the junior partners in this relationship. But if we look at the residential school survivors, we watch the courage that they displayed in fighting for justice. We watch the forgiveness that they have embodied and the grace and the courage, we ought to see that they have been acting as the moral leaders in this relationship. And I hope that that's the takeaway that Canadians remember long after the TRC has done its mandate. All right. And thank you all. We've got to stop there. But uh, not only a good discussion, but an important discussion. Wab Canoe in uh, Winnipeg, uh, Gabrielle Skimshaw and uh, Hayden King here in uh, Toronto. <laughs>